So as we're recording this on Friday, people watch on Monday. Uh, there is a uh, there is a brand new uh, Thomas Friedman uh, column in, uh, in New York Times. Uh, it's uh, I love the headline. A trip to Ukraine clarified the stakes. Period, and they're huge. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it if Thomas Friedman wrote that article, but he was like, a trip to U Ukraine really clarified the stakes for me. They don't matter that much. Who cares? <laughs> that made me realize I don't give a shit about it. Either. Yeah. <laughs> did he did he go with Biden? <laughs> I don't think he went with Biden, but uh, he says, um, uh, when visiting Kiev last week, uh, my first trip to Ukraine since Vladimir Putin's invasion in February 2022, uh, I don't know how often he visited before that. Uh, I tried to get my exercise every morning by walking the grounds of St. Michael's Golden Domed Monastery. Its serenity, though, has been disrupted by a jarring exhibit of destroyed Russian tanks and armored personnel carriers. During my walks, I poke my head into these jagged, rocket-pierced hulks, wondering what terrible death must have come to the Russian soldiers operating them. Um, and uh, and I just, like, okay, uh he, you know, he spends a lot of time soul searching here about how uh, perfect justice would require expelling the Russians from every inch of Ukrainian territory, presumably including Donbass and the Crimea. And uh, but like that may uh, that may not be uh, be possible uh, and what to do about it. But like the thing that really strikes me about this um is that he he says uh that like okay uh what putin is doing in ukraine it's my favorite paragraph is not just reckless not just a war of choice not just an invasion in a class of its own for overreach <laughs> yeah I mean, sure. he, had to, he had to add that a class of its own one lest anyone forget <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Don't uh, forget about other recent uh, wars of uh, choice and uh, aggression. Mendacity, immorality, and incompetence. All right, so class of its own for overreach, mendacity, immorality, and incompetence, all wrapped up in a farrago of lies. What he is doing is evil. Um, uh, he has trumped up any number of shifting justifications. And, you know, look, maybe that's just too obvious to be worth belaboring too much but um but um uh, reckless war of choice overreach mendacity immorality incompetence uh justified by lies shifting justifications i i don't know i mean i feel like uh i, I feel like something from like that maybe happened in my early 20s is coming back to me right now yeah I mean, it's amazing, like uh, how crystal clear his analysis of the world is when he's talking about a, an adversary of the United States government. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, you know, OK, yeah, sure. Um, this is, you know, so he goes. Uh, um, that's uh, what is so evil beyond the death and pain and trauma and destruction uh, he has inflicted on so many Ukrainians is that at a time when climate change, famine, health crisis, and more are stressing uh, planet Earth. Uh, the last thing humanity needed was to divert so much attention, collaborative energy, and money and lives to respond to Putin's war. Wait, wait. I'm sorry. What is he talking about? Other than, like, I'm sorry, Ukraine and Russia and the United States that's footing the bill for this shit? Nobody on the rest of the planet is has their attention diverted to the war in Ukraine. And I know that seems like a harsh thing to say. Sure. But it is, like, it is like outside of, like, uh, Ukraine and Russia and America, which it's, like, you know, played up, like, very intensely because we're involved in it. Uh, I don't think this has diverted the attention of the world from global warming or any of these other problems that are facing other places in the world who maybe could use an ounce of attention outside of, you know, the, the, an, an, another war Thomas Friedman is promoting. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's also. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's like, OK, does Thomas Friedman want people to pay less attention to the war in Ukraine? It kind of doesn't seem like it. Um, he. Um, uh, so he quotes Timothy Snyder because, of course, he does. Uh, this is not a war in which the aggressor has some vision, some outline for the future. Rather, on the contrary, for them, everything is you know, black. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not smart enough, nor have I read uh, Timothy Snyder's works. Like I, I, I'm not smart enough to critique him as a historian. All I will say about Timothy Snyder is that he has replaced George Orwell as like the most cited author by stupid people. So like. <laughs> 
I don't know. I don't like. I can't speak to the work of Timothy Schneider. I mean, like I, a lot of people really respect his work. I've I haven't read yeah. Bloodland. Bloodlands is like the the big book. Yeah. I haven't read it, but like everyone I see quoting this guy, I know for sure. I know enough to know that they're fucking stupid. So, yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, <laughs> like, I I mean, I think probably in Orwell's case, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of selective, uh, you know, selective reading there. Uh, there's, uh, I always think of, uh, there's a, um, like the, the sort of most popular edition of, uh, I don't remember it's 19 years. I think it's animal farm has a, uh, in the introduction, there's a quote from, um, there's a quote from Orwell's essay, why I write, where he says that since 1936, every serious line I've written, has been written against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism. And they just like cut off the last three words. <laughs> yeah. 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 Of the sentence of the introduction. Uh, Snyder, I, I suspect maybe getting less of a bad rap. I've only read uh, a little bit of what he's written, but you know, he seems to be like just a, uh, well, I mean, he's all in on this Ukraine war. He's definitely all in on the Ukraine war. He was definitely all in on like Russia gate and how, you know, the most important thing in the world was, you know, that, uh, Trump was a fascist and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, before that, I mean, he seems like, you know, maybe he says things that are worth reading on other subjects, but like on contemporary politics, he's in a very like, uh, you know, he's in a pretty, uh, he's in a pretty clear lane. Uh, so Friedman says, uh, that I, Ukrainian... like, I get back to this idea that Friedman is like, oh, like it's just we we have to divert all this attention from like I don't know spending money in this country or fixing global warming because we have to keep arming Ukraine to the tune of like three trillion dollars. Like, oh, we just we have to do that. It's di it's diverted our attention. We have no other choice here. And I know, like in in like look, there are no good choices here. You know, like sure. like yeah. uh, like uh, you know, like I th th this war, like I mean, it, I. It's made fool. It's made a biggest enough a fool of me already. Sure. So like I'm not like I, I thought there was no way Russia was going to invade Ukraine because I was like, oh, that seemed catastrophically suicidal and stupid. But you know, it hasn't stopped uh, America sure, from no, doing sometimes great it. powers do things that yeah, are catastrophically no, stupid. Yeah, yeah, like exactly. But I, I don't know. I'm like this this offensive currently going on. It, it there are still plenty of surprises to come. None of them good, I imagine. But like it does seem. No. Like even as even Friedman is wrestling with, everybody kind of understands like what the contours of like ending this war look like, and it's like a huge achievement for Ukraine that like that they basically won in my opinion. If all they lose is Crimea and Donbass or like the eastern part of the country, which is functionally not really part of Ukraine to begin with, or I don't know, like most of the people uh. there view themselves as Russian. It's very complicated. I I feel like I'm getting too far out of my depth, but like I think in the West, like the the. The uh, sort of patrons of this horrible ongoing war, I think it's very clear what it would take to end it. And then they're all just trying to avoid doing that thing, which involves some sort of negotiated concession to Russia. Right. Yeah. No, I, I think so. I think that like um, that's obviously it's a horrible, both sort of criminal and self-defeating thing to do. I'm right there with you. I didn't think it was going to happen. Uh, I was, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the st you know the joke that I would always tell when like Ukraine came up, I, f I feel felt a little bad about when I when the invasion actually started, uh, which was that you know my main comment on the situation in the Ukraine is that if they wanted me to leave off that definite article, they should have been nicer to my family. But <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, good point. <laughs> uh, but um, but in any case, like uh, like look, I didn't think they would do it. It was a stupid thing to do. Sometimes you know, sometimes imperial leaders do stupid things. It's a, you know, it's an awful criminal thing that they did, but I guess I know you're not supposed to do this because this is committing the cardinal sin of what about ism, but I always think about the invasion of Iraq and what I would have, what, what I would have wanted any other like rival power to do in yeah. response to the invasion of Iraq. And I don't think like become more and more militarily involved with propping up Iraq until such time as we were on the brink of world war three is what I wanted, wanted them to do in response. I think that um, I, I think if there had been some way for, I don't know, China or somebody to like broker a diplomatic settlement to either, either hold off the war or stop it midway through uh, I would have been, you know, I would have been in favor of that. You know, I mean, I'd obviously,
Yeah. Like if China had decided it was in their absolute vital interest to like uh, like prop up Saddam Hussein against the U.S. military and did so by like shipping him carte blanche, like the, the, the cream of the crop of their defense industry. Like, you know, we wouldn't have liked it. But I mean, like if you have a problem with that, then like ask yourself, what the fuck are we doing with Ukraine now? Yeah, no, totally. I mean, and without even getting into the uh, like the stuff from the uh, the uh the guy the airman who was like posting posting stuff to impress his friends in the discord server uh that like pentagon documents that like uh that there are you know there was like some tiny number and it was in a support role but there were like special forces (laughs) boots on the ground in ukraine uh and you know, like the CIA being logistically involved yeah. in operations. It, do, to like, it does yeah. not bear thinking about too long because I, I, <laughs> I don't. It goes back to the dead zone. Uh, yeah, yeah, right exactly. The beginning. <laughs> I, I just I don't want to know about it. I don't. I just try to keep it out of my head. Yeah. Uh, so yes, uh, this, is, for, this is why I choose to live in New York. By the way, because <laughs> I want to. I want to go out and like like I want to just turn to dust like that. I don't want to stick around after after the first fucking bomb falls. Yeah, I guess we're. Uh, I guess. I guess in L.A. we're gonna have some sort of uh, night of the comet scenario. <laughs> Manhattan Miracle Mile. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, yeah, Friedman says this is as obvious a case of right versus wrong, good versus evil, as you'll find in international relations since World War II. And you know, I, I don't know. I guess I just always like think about there's that. Um, you know, when Friedman was on Charlie Rose, uh, I think. This. Suck yeah. on this. Suck Yeah, exactly. It's like, come I on. Mean, what? Back to like, you know, he, 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 he sees good and evil when it's, when it's Russia and what they're doing to Ukraine. And, you know, fair enough. They invaded sure. another country. There are lots of people are being killed. It's awful. But like the, 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 the contrast that to the utter glibness with which he discussed the U.S. military killing, I don't know, about a million people in Iraq. Yeah, and you know, making millions of refugees and causing like decades of regional instability that led to the rise of ISIS. Creating uh, ISIS. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I don't know. You uh you might think that a more self reflective man would uh would, would maybe take a you know at least take a pass on commenting on uh on wars of choice launched by other people, but obviously well, that's you know, why he there... gets the big bucks. That's why he gets the big bucks. You know, you can't you can't have that column space in the New York Times without having your sense of like shame be surgically removed from your brain. Yeah, I, I'm I'm actually really confused about so like is there an editing process for New York Times columnists? Like beyond, like I, I said, this. Like I'm sure they get they, they get a copy edit, but like I don't think anything close to like a fact check, you know. Which is like, to be fair, I don't think like most sure. news. I don't think you can really fact check news articles, but you think for like I don't know the the opinion because you know like the fact checking is like in reporting the piece, like your editor yeah. checks that. Um, but the opinion piece is like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think they're edited. I yeah, think, I mean, like, you know, they, I, I think mean, they like, just let them cook. <laughs> yeah, kind of seems that way. Uh, like, cause it, I mean, okay. I mean, I understand even not having fact checks for like opinion columns, but, uh, but I don't know. I mean, if I like, if I'm like talking to Bosker about something I'm going to write for Jacobin, like every once in a while, and it's like opinion, it's argument every once in a while, they'll be like, no, that's a dumb idea. Let's not do that one. Uh, and, and it just, I, I don't know as a, as a long, you know, as somebody who hates himself enough to like read a lot of New York Times opinion writing, mm-hmm. uh, I've never had the sense that that was part of the process there that anybody was empowered to do that. Like David Brooks could like literally write, you know, columns about conversations he made up in his head with like what he imagines like a woke college kid would be like. Yeah, or like having to track down every cab driver on earth who's ever uh, supposedly had a, a, a charming, a, you know, sparkling, witty dialogue with Thomas Friedman. <laughs> yeah uh in the he doesn't uh he doesn't specifically attribute it to uh to the cab driver and uh but he does say a lot of people in kiev were were asking him whether uh putin's buddy trump was going to be elected again so you know his like his his habit of relying on local wisdom to yeah. uh to fill out his columns uh hasn't uh hasn't gone anywhere you 
have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument to access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more. Go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>